uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this session on critical raw materials. But before I introduce the speakers and the subject, let me just mention one incredible experience which I had this morning. Uh, I used the time very early in the morning to go to a place 10 minutes from here, the Abrahamic family house. I was not familiar that this exists, but a friend of mine had told me about it. It's a church, a synagogue, and a mosque, all on one compound. And it is a strong sign of tolerance that the United Arab Emirates send with this wonderful architecture, which is not just a museum, but where people pray, people sing, people have masses, uh, services. Uh, it was deeply moving, and especially in these times, I can only encourage you to use the time to go there and see it, and one can only wish that this message that the Emiratis send with this uh, wonderful institution will be heard uh, in all major Abrahamitic uh, religions. Well, we have a very important subject, and that is critical raw materials. And last year, uh, after the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we woke up, and I say it as a German, also we, and especially we woke up, and immediately recognized how much dependent we were on, in this case, Russian gas. And at that time, at the last World Policy Conference, the 15th edition, we already had a panel on critical raw materials with a representative from the EU Commission. And we all stated, well, the dependency on critical raw materials, on some critical raw materials on China, for instance, are even higher than those dependencies that we had uh, with Russian gas. And we urged the Commission and urged the policymakers do something to diversify, do something to start mining uh, again in Europe, uh, look for other places. Uh, and the question that we ask today, and which is the lead question uh, here for the panel, is what has changed during last year? Was this, uh, well, this strong demand heard by policymakers uh, in Brussels and Washington? Uh, on the Gulf, elsewhere in the world, uh, not to rely on one or two countries alone, but to diversify. That's the, the main question, and I uh, introduce the first speaker. I ask all speakers to be brief. We said 10 minutes, uh, so that we have time to discuss within the panel, but also with you. Uh, first speaker is uh, Philippe Chalmin. Uh, Philippe is what you could call a walking encyclopedia <laughs> uh, on critical raw materials. Uh, since 37 years, uh, he publishes uh, an annual report on the status of critical raw materials. So long before it became a political issue, a heated issue, he was an expert on these questions. And I think there is hardly anybody else, at least not in Europe, who knows more about critical raw materials than Philippe, who was a professor at Paris Dauphin, and uh, uh, well, who is a, a great guy, and we are proud to have you. The floor is yours, Philippe. Well, thanks very much. Uh, besides, I would say, I don't think I'm real expert on critical raw materials. Christophe Poinceau is probably for that far better than me. Uh, in fact, uh, Cyclop were publishing a, a commodity yearbook, so we cover all kinds of commodities. Uh, also, sometimes we might be wrong. 
exactly one year ago, we were just in this place, or the hotel uh, on the other side, and I told you that among the most bullish commodities we had in uh, 22 were what I called the electric materials that were lithium, nickel, graphite, and some others. One year later, November 23, we have seen a complete reverse. Among all commodities, uh, be it energy, agricultural, minerals, and metals, and the rest, the worst performance on world markets in 1923 has been for lithium. And lithium has lost around 70% of its value, coming from roughly $75,000 a ton to $25,000, more or less, still slightly more than it was in 1920. Nickel, which was completely foolish in 22, reaching at some time in the uh, early time, in the uh, Asian hours, uh, more than $100,000 per ton, nowadays is around 18,000. Even graphite, and we have much spoken about graphite those last uh, two weeks uh, because of the quotas set up uh, by the Chinese government. But before that, the price of graphite had been declining this year by 30%. Same thing for cobalt. Cobalt uh, uh, used to uh, be somewhere between 50 and 80 cents per pound. Now it's hardly between 17 and 18, and it reached even a low of 13 cents per pound uh, some months ago. In fact, the only all of, of all those metals which behaved, I would say, a bit more positively was copper. Uh, also, last year we were around $10,000 per ton. Now we are hardly around 8,000. Let's be frank, be it electric metals, criticals, strategic, or just uh, common non fuse metals, all metals markets are, have been declining in uh, this recent year. Why such a situation? Of course, we have seen uh, in many uh, derivatives markets a kind of end of a speculative exuberance. And it must be stressed, well, the prices I gave you uh, for lithium, for cobalt, are on some very opaque markets. And so uh, sometimes uh, you really have uh, exuberant uh, prices without links to reality. Also, it must be stressed that in many cases, uh, anticip anticipated demand, especially coming from the battery industry, hasn't yet materialized because, as you know, uh, an industrial process is something which is quite long uh, to put in place. In fact, when I look at forecasts for 1924, what I see are mainly surpluses. The International Copper Study Group anticipates a surplus of 500,000 tons of copper out of a world demand of around 25 million tons. For cobalt, we know there are huge stock in DRC in Congo. And uh, uh, for nickel, uh, with the development of Indonesian production, uh, we are more or less assured to have a market in surplus for the next three years. What a contrast, what a paradox, would I say, uh, with what we hear uh, on a long-term basis. On a long-term basis, we still see the same analysis, that is, reports on growing demand, linked, of course, to green transition. By 2030, that is more or less tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, copper and nickel demand should grow by 70%, cobalt by 150%, and the demand even for graphite and lithium should be multiplied by six or seven. 
by 2030, we should, we could have, we should, no, we could, we might have deficits of 10 to 50 percent of, 10 to 15 percent of demand for a couple or nickel, 30 or 45 percent for other uh, metals. And as you know, and you uh, said it, governments have been, for all this year, frantically searching for mines and resources, be it in the US, be it in the EU, uh, and still China remains on many markets the key, uh, and China used its power to put uh, some export quotas. That's the great news of the year. We had uh, export quotas this summer for germanium and gallium, and uh, just a fortnight ago for graphite. May I remind you that for the moment when you have a battery, its anode is in graphite, and China is uh, uh, producing around 70% of world graphite, be it natural or synthetic. Of course, as I told you last year, all this forecast, we must take into account the fact that we don't know, and there is a factor which we don't master, which is technological progress. You frankly don't know what there will be in batteries in 30 years' time what kind of energy we will use, how we will manage to stock electricity and the rest. In fact, and I would like to use my remaining time just to get away from the critical raw materials as such, and to tell you that, to my mind, the most critical of all raw materials, and in fact for the whole century, the most difficult one, will be copper. Copper, I would say, more than ever. Because copper, it's the green metal par excellence. Today's demand, I told you, is around 25 million tons. By 2035, estimates range between 40 and 50 million tons. And, uh, and well, just to tell you, an average Westerner uh, uh, needs about 200, 250 kilos of copper. An average inhabitant of this world uh, uses 60 kilos. So you have a huge demand coming, and to meet that demand, you can, of course, go in recycling scrap, but you reach sometime very quickly some limits. Then you can reuse mine waste uh, with lower content. And, of course, you can have new mines. But new mines, it takes 15 to 20 years, average 17 years, to develop a new mine, uh, be it in copper or anything else. And the capital costs are huge. Just let me give you an example. Uh, Tech Resources, Canadian company, as a big project in uh, Chile, Quebrada, Quebrada Blanca II. Uh, it should produce around 300,000 tons of copper per year. The project uh, projection of cost in uh, uh, 2019 was $5 billion. Now it's $9 billion. First quantum, another a Canadian comp uh, or U.S. company, um, is active in Panama. The project of Panama Copper uh, is worth $11 billion. It is just now blocked by the Panamian authorities. And uh, just uh, last week, uh, first quantum market cap lo lost $6 billion on uh, Toronto uh, Stock Exchange. Uh, in fact, many new projects are barred by political, environmental concerns. And we have the same Greens which, uh, um, who uh, are advocating energy transition and who are blocking a new kind of new mine. Copper, in fact, for me, uh, will speak probably of other metals, lithium, rare earth, etc. But the true strategic metal uh, of the 21st century, and in fact the true strategic commodity of the 21st century, 
I think it will be cobalt, it, 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 sorry, it will be copper, and uh, it's a reverse to ancient times. Recently, I was uh, in the south of Spain in Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto has, is uh, probably the oldest uh, functioning mine coming back to the Roman times. At that time, copper was used with tin to make uh, bronze and to, uh, uh, and to uh, uh, manufacture spades and so on. Well, uh, it was also the key mineral of the Industrial Revolution. I'm pretty sure it will be exactly the same for the 21st century. Economists will say uh, copper used to be a good economic indicator when we're uh, speaking of Dr. Copper. Well, I do think that Cop Dr. Copper is back right now. Thank you so much uh, for, for uh, bringing us directly into the volatility of the uh, prices of the uh, markets of the speculation and uh, which makes it even more difficult for for politicians and uh, administrations to well really take the right decisions i think that was a, a very good start and uh, i would like now to turn to the business side uh, we have uh, jonathan uh, codero with us jonathan uh, is a, a young german working for a, a pretty young global company, Eurasian Resource Group, which is, uh, in my point of view, one of the greatest hopes that we have, as it really tries to do everything in, in mining projects all over the world uh, to help us diversify. Jonathan uh, uh, started his career with the Boston Consulting Group, and since 14 years he is uh, dealing with uh, well, the subject which we have right now with uh, critical raw materials and he is today the number two in this global company and uh, is responsible for the business development of that company and uh, well great that you could make it and uh, Jonathan the floor is yours what's the business side you see that there are changes uh, concerning governments, EU commission, do you get enough support for your endeavors? Yeah. Please. Well, thanks first of all for having me. It's an honor to be here and very energizing to be on a panel that is so keen on making a difference um, to this very important topic. As Friedbert mentioned, I'm a mining executive. Um, I've been working in a lot of different countries, most of which are probably not on your vacation wish list. Um, our company is about 80,000 people. We operate in 20 countries. And we supply the, my, the metals needed for our global battery transition. <coughs> Through our work, we've seen firsthand the evolution of this very conversation um, that we're gathered to discuss. And we also recognize the urgency. So let me get right to the point. Uh, building energy systems um, powered by clean energy technologies requires a huge increase in the supply of critical materials huh? that we just heard. So it's a 400% increase by 2030 or a 600% increase by 2050 to achieve our net zero go goals. In other words, if we don't increase the supply massively, we will not maybe, but for sure, miss our net zero goals. We recognize that the irresponsible behavior of some mining companies over the years eroded the sector's social license to operate. And now it's left on us to do much better across the spectrum of ESG considerations because essentially sustainability and the social license go hand in hand. Resources companies need to dust itself off. Our reputation has taken a hit over the decades, and rightly so, but we cannot hide anymore. We will not be able to perform and uplift communities where they don't want us to operate, plain and simple. We operate at the discretion of these communities and society as a whole. We need to take a more active role in communities, not only the host communities in frontier markets where we operate, but also and especially the communities in developed markets, the ultimate customers of iPhones, Teslas and co. 
that today can hardly name five mining companies if you ask them on the street. This is our fault and our responsibility. At the same time, policymakers need to be open to mining as an industry. We are seeing this in the Middle East, where Saudi Arabia has made mining the third pillar of Vision 2030. But we also see adverse forces in Latin America, that we just heard, and the mere standstill in Europe. Policymakers and advocates in this room also have the responsibility to not fall for an overly simplistic narrative by way of example, mining companies are bad, electric vehicles are good. The reality is that the EV sector alone will require 165,000 tons of cobalt by 2026, um, which is the equivalent of the total supply today. EVs also require four times more copper than a combustion engine. So as you can see, the narrative isn't as binary as some may suggest. Yes, electric vehicles are good, but we need to accelerate our common understanding that our industry must be part of the solution and not part of the problem. If you're serious about net zero, you have to be pro-mining. Now you may ask, but what about recycling? Well, recycling could help, but a binary argument here is also counterproductive. The answer is that both things are true. To meet the global demand, we need to uplift primary production today, and we need to learn more about recycling of batteries and scrap materials. Analysts estimate that by 2050, 40 to 75 percent of Europe's clean energy metal needs could come from recycling. But if and only if, Europe provides substantial financing and investments now. But as of today, neither sufficient second life material nor the required recycling technologies exist on an industrial scale. Just ask yourself, how many old smartphones do you keep at home in your drawer? The biggest purchase order in history, as my CEO likes to call it, also requires a fairer distribution of value along the supply chain. We heard the example of the Democratic Republic of Congo that holds 80% of the global cobalt reserves. And if you take your, your smartphone that in the store take, costs maybe $1,000, <coughs> the material costs in the far, uh, smartphone is about $200, the battery is about 20, but only $1.50 is the value of Congo that goes back into this country um, that is indispensable for even having this device. Where national policymakers find its boundaries, industry participants need to take action. So we at ERG, for example, we brought together market participants to create binding rules of engagement for responsible sourcing. The 140 organization strong global battery alliance and its flagship project, the Battery Passport, is conveying digital information to end consumers about key ESG and lifestyle metrics. So what does it mean? In the very near future, every single EV will have a QR code that allows full transparency on material provenance cradle to grave. In closing, I would like to reference the importance of knowledge sharing and innovation. We heard building a copper mine uh, takes 15 years, sometimes longer. We don't have this time. The role of accelerating exploration through technology is indispensable. We spent at ERG the last couple of years in developing smart exploration technology, among other initiatives, and we're about to unveil in Saudi Arabia a fleet of autonomous Mars rover-like sampling robots. This is a technology that we hope to share with governments and industry alike. This is what positive action looks like. Uh, yes, it means sharing some secrets, and we may be even taking a hit in the short term, but it brings us all forward. The future of critical minerals will not be owned by a single company, rather a brain's trust of policymakers, governments and industries willing, industry players willing to make a difference. So once again, thanks for having me today and giving me the opportunity to address you today. I'm looking forward to hearing each and every one of your proposal, because what is very clear to me is that mining is a contact sports and no one company alone can tackle these issues alone. 
Thank you so much. Uh, it was also fascinating and, and I think very helpful. Um, I, I would like now to turn to Christophe Pinceau. Christophe is, uh, in a way, the, the French, official French voice for critical raw material. He is the uh, deputy director general and the scientific director of the French Geological Survey, BIGM. Uh, he's in charge of defining and implementing the overall scientific strategy of that body in different fields. Um, and, uh, well, he is deeply involved in those issues. For instance, he ha has been uh, vital uh, in launching uh, OFREMI, the French observatory in charge of monitoring the CRM value change. So, another expert, but someone who really has the government uh, position and who perhaps also is able to convey the one or the other message to the French uh, government, uh, what could be extremely helpful. Uh, S'il vous plaît, uh, Christophe, c'est à vous. Thank you very much for, the, for your introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be with you today and I'm going to try to in fact, to give you a few insights regarding the critical questions of the critical raw materials. So a lot have already been said regarding the scene of this uh, issue, but I want just to maybe add a few things to what has already been mentioned. So first, we mentioned a lot the need for the energy transition. For sure, it's very important, in particular, to mitigate the global climate change. But we do not have to forget that we have also to uh, handle at the same time the digital transition which is also uh, requiring a very large amount of critical raw materials. And for two-thirds of them, they are the same as for the energy transition. So we may have a kind of trade-off to have between the two. And also the development of the emerging countries, which require a significant amount of uh, critical raw materials for <coughs> developing the infrastructure. So altogether, it yields to a very significant increase of the demand, and the number of you are huge, and it's a real issue to uh, assess whether we will be able to meet this demand. I just remind just a few figures. For instance, the uh, volume of lithium that will be required by 2040 to develop the uh, uh, electric uh, core is four times, 40 times higher than what we are using today. Uh, it's 20 times higher for nickel, cobalt, and graphite. It's 10 times higher for the RF. So it's a very huge number, in particular when you consider that, in fact, it requires, as has already been mentioned, between 15 and 20 years to open new mines. Another point which is very important is a large number of these metals are not taken directly from the ground for themselves. They are byproducts from other metals, which means that in terms of dynamics of the market, they are not directly related to the, uh, to the need, to the demand, in fact. And uh, it means that uh, we have, therefore, some highly complex value chains that it, and it's already a first, uh, is, uh, first challenge to be able to depict, describe, understand all of them. And also, um, the value chains are very long. I mean, with large number of transformation steps, and many of them are dispersed in many countries. Uh, and it's once again uh, a factor of complexity that we need to be able to understand and to take into account. So it means to, that in this situation, we have some... Uh, long but also weak value chains, uh, which can be uh, uh, um, perturbated by any event that could occur. And uh, we had a large number of, of disruptions in the last years, uh, whatever the, the size of the disruption. Maybe two points which is important to keep in mind. First, the critical ma raw materials are rather dispersed all over the world. So when it is mainly located in a single country, it's not because it's the only country where you find it. It's mainly it's because this, this country has been specialized in this domain, has been exploring a lot, and has been exploiting this resource. But uh, for sure, we may find it uh, elsewhere, even if it takes time. And second, we have also not to forget the key role of China, uh, which is not only anymore on the mining side, but rather on the refining and transformation. And for more than 10 elements right now, they are really dominating the market. I mean, they are... Uh, most than 90% of the overall supply worldwide is coming from China. So it means that it's a very uh, highly dependent to this country uh, and also high risk in case of perturbations. 
and it can be very uh, various elements like not only rare earth, but also graphite, gallium, germanium, tungsten, magnesium, so a large number of elements which, can, which are used in many usage. So what can we do in order to uh, recover, I will say, a part of our independence and sovereignty? So first, we need to be able to understand quite well all these value chains. So it's uh, the domain of the mineral intelligence. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction that we launched in France a dedicated observatory uh, uh, exactly one year ago. Uh, similar structure exists uh, in other countries, and uh, there is a need for uh, increasing this work, for networking this type of activity, and we are, for instance, collaborating very efficiently with the DIRA in Germany. Uh, second, we need also to uh, ensure uh, an optimized use of the natural resource. So we need to deal with, to cope with the uh, recycling activities with the secondary resources which is available in the urban mines. It's something quite important. It's also a very good way in order to develop some new extracting, purification, transformation industry. But we all have to keep in mind it will never meet the demand. Because what you recycle right now is what has been produced 20 years ago, roughly. The amount of critical water was not the same at the time. The type of, my, of metals or critical raw materials was different. So for sure it's very important, but it will never meet all the demand we have. So therefore the only way is to open new mines. It has to be very clear. And as you mentioned very efficiently, if you want to be pro-energy um, transition, you have to be pro-mine uh, development, in fact. Uh, not only in the emerging countries, but also in Europe, in the developing, developed countries, we still have a lot of resources in the underground. It's not uh, uh, known and it's not exploited right now, mainly for economic and social reasons. I will be back on that later on. So we need to develop some new responsible mining activities, and it's a huge challenge. And last but not least, because it's still not enough, we will have to secure supply from uh, third countries with, uh, thanks to long-term contracts, long-term strategic partnerships. So what's new in 2023 regarding these four lines? So I will say that uh, there have been a very significant mobilization of the uh, government and uh, uh, national, <laughs> national government with the creation of several mineral intelligence agencies, the development of investment funds and tools in many countries, uh, in France, for instance, a strong uh, development of uh, environmental, societal, and governance criteria uh, regulations, uh, at, in particular at the uh, European level in order to ensure that uh, new mines will be responsible mines, uh, environmental friendly. Uh, development of ambitious policy, and I have to mention the Critical Raw Material Act, which is still under discussion at the European level, and which is very ambitious regarding the um, rate uh, of independence for the uh, supply of critical raw materials coming either from prim primary resources or from recycling. Uh, also, the development of industrial partnerships f with Europe, with the United States, and so on, which is uh, the, the first steps uh, in order to develop some long-term contracts. But at the same time, and it's also something new, we had some restriction measures which have been taken by China regarding germanium and gallium first in June, graphite two weeks ago. I'm, not sure, I'm quite sure the list is not uh, finished. And so it means that uh, we have to be prepared to a potential uh, not disruption, but at least reduction or quotas or production or exportation, I would say rather, uh, of these minerals which are used in many applications from defense to medicines, thanks to uh, through energy and so on. And third point, the number of new projects which arrive on the market is very limited, and it's not at scale by comparison to what we need. So the main question of the discrepancy between the need of the future and the, what the market is going to be able to uh, to supply is huge and is increasing, and it's therefore uh, posing the questions uh, about uh, how can we ensure the energy transition if we do not have the resource. Uh, my feeling right now is that we are not able, we are not going to be able to meet some highly political uh, objectives which has been uh, proposed and voted. For instance, the uh, 2035 uh, obligation of full electrical car in Europe. Um, from my perspective, not sure we'll have the resources to do that at that year. And it's not a question of stockpile of natural resources in the ground. It's a question of how fast can you extract this resource 
to provide it to the market and be able to meet the demand. So it's a, really a question of the, the dates at which we want to reach this target instead of the target by itself. And it's something which is quite important with many repercussions, many uh, consequences in particular in terms of uh, uh, political uh, uh, policy development, policy making, and also uh, confidence in the global uh, decision making process because I'm quite sure that at least at the European level, many of the citizens may react regarding the, uh, the change in these uh, strong objectives which, which has been put, put forward uh, by the government. Yeah. Another important message is uh, also uh, the fact that we need new minds. It seems that it's very clear, even in Europe, even in France. So uh, with the CRM Act, there is some new exploration program which is uh, developing right now. It's very important. But the main question beyond is uh, how are we going to convince our citizens of the interest of building new mines potentially not far from their houses? And uh, it's a real question, a real debate that need to be open about what are the consequences of our way of life? Uh, how can we assume the consequence of this way of life? Uh, and we need to uh, start from now uh, uh, work in order to increase the acceptability of uh, this new type of uh, activity, and it's for sure embed high uh, ethical issues, because otherwise it means that we are exporting, in fact, the uh, detrimental effect of our way of life. So as a conclusion, I think, uh, based on what the question you ask, what's the main message from 2023? We have some very positive mobilization from the national government, and uh, which is really moving forward. Uh, the topic is back to the forefront of the geopolitics, and it's very important. And you can see for in, we can see at least, for in, in instance, in France that uh, in any of the displace, official displacement for our presidents, the topic of the critical raw material is on, uh, on, in debate. But at the same time, we still have this perspective of a strong discrepancy between the political trajectory that we try to meet and the effective industrial capabilities to produce the materials. <clears throat> so it's, uh, for me, a potential for a, a new crisis not only for the market of metals, but also in terms of confidence in the policy-making process. Thank you very much. Yeah. Merci, Christophe. C'était, uh, encore une fois, très intéressant et uh, important. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> well, we, Tong Nim and I, we, we composed this panel very carefully. So we had the academic view, the government view, the business view, and now we have the finance view. Uh, with uh, Nicolas Piau, and also the energy and climate view. <coughs> because uh, Nicolas uh, has been a long time working for Angie uh, en France, a huge energy company. So he is an energy man, basically. But then he started to set up his own company, that is Tilt Capital. And Tilt Capital is an asset management group which supports Startups, well, startups in different phases uh, concerning the energy transition. And, uh, well, that is an extremely important and interesting endeavor. And, Nicola, we are happy to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Freebert, and um, <clears throat> very happy to be there. Um, it's really an honor. And it's also quite intimidating because, frankly, after, uh, after Philippe, uh, Jonathan, and, and, and Christophe, as you were saying, I'm, I'm not at all an expert of this field. Um, I'm more on the receiving side of all of what you've described as an, as an energy guy. Um, and, and actually, I'm going to try to, to um, bring on board what I've just heard during the panel. Um, I think for us, what it means when you, look, when you look at it from the energy perspective, and that's maybe the first message, is I I would strongly oppose any views that say that with the, the energy transition, the energy trilemma is dead. You may have heard this, you may have heard that, you know, energy trilemma is basically you need to choose between, you need to compose between three pillars, <clears throat> affordability, sustainability, and security of supply. And I think what 2023 has brought is actually that security of supply has become has become the you know the the main focus of that of that energy trilemma. 
I think it bears two challenges. The first one is we should not forget about the other two, affordability and sustainability, and we'll come back to that. <clears throat> I think the second, the second implication is that um, it brings back energy in the field of geopolitics and, and, and industry. I think over the course of the last decade, energy has been too much seen as a financial opportunity for a very simple reason. It was the early stages of renewables development. It was about securing contracts, EPCs, financing, etc. And there were no questions asked, also because it was very limited in scope compared to other forms of energy. I think today this is changing radically, and, and we need to acknowledge that. <clears throat> so I think that would be the, the first message is what we are seeing as energy investors is that for all the, the, the messages that have been passed by, by, uh, uh, by the panel is security of supply is coming back as a major topic in any energy investment. <clears throat> and what it means for us, for example, is today we may be embarking, and, and you opened, Friedbert, saying, you know, Russian gas may have been a problem here or there, but eventually that's not the real issue. The real issue is much more the dependency on China on a number of topics and in general with those key materials. Today, when you look at companies in which we invest, this is not a topic. This is not a topic because it is not seen. Today, if you want to obtain <clears throat> any, uh, if you want to obtain an inverter, if you want to obtain um, nitrium gallium based uh, uh, chip or silici silici uh, silicium carbide based chip, you have no issues. The question is, how long will that be? And so, of course, all what you've mentioned around, you know, enhancing the, the extraction, enhancing the, recyc the recycling, etc. So having additional resources is something that as energy investors, we welcome, but I think we should be much more vocal about the need for that. I absolutely agree there will be no energy transition without additional mining, about, without an, uh, additional extraction. But then it also bears the question, of course, of sustainability. <clears throat> and here, let me maybe come back to one element coming from, from that world. Um, I think if there, I would have one message on this is let's try to not make the same mistakes as we have done over the last decades on oil and gas. We cannot afford to have another Ogoni disaster or Macondo disaster with the, the mining industry for, the, for those critical raw materials. I think if we have that, and Jonathan, you said it very clearly, there is, you know, there is probably some image issue to, but beyond the image, I think there is the, the fact that if we have something of the magnitude of what happened uh, in Nigeria with the Ogoni community or with Macondo with BP, I think it will put a very, very, it will cast a very strong shadow on, on the reality of this, uh, of the sustainability of that energy transition. And, and for this, I, and please bear with me, I'm not at all an expert on that. I do think we need to, to engage into more cooperation on this, on this front. Actually, I even think that this whole critical material issue could be a way to foster a greater cooperation between consuming countries and producing countries or extracting countries. Because let's be clear also, today when we are saying we need to mine more, we need to refine more, who are the destinaries of those, of those materials? It's rather the developed and rich, you know, uh, I would say even rich population of the, of the more developed countries. How does that affect locally the people who are on the land where you have this extraction and this, and this processing? And I think here we need to engage into more cooperation. I think it should, it should translate into profit sharing. Uh, I think we should maybe learn some lessons from some oil countries that have been fairly good at this. Uh, I always used to say to people, why don't we drill for oil and gas in, in 
in Switzerland, where is there is where there are no taxes, virtually no taxes, and why do we drill in Norway, where there are 78% taxes? Well, because there is oil and gas in Norway. And I don't think the Norwegian government or the Norwegian people will tell you that it has affected us in a, in a bad way that there was 78% taxes on, on each barrel that was taken out of the ground. And I think we should have that same kind of reflection on the critical raw material. We need to use that to transfer skills, money, um, uh, maybe try to create value chains locally so that we actually build not only some resilience, uh, of course we need to do it in Europe, but we also need to, to build those trusted um, value chains on the critical raw materials outside of Europe or India or, or wherever so that we can multiply those trusted value chain. And I remember last year, Kaldoum uh, al-Mubarak said that he, he, he was, the, the UAE were focusing on those trusted value chain. I think this is one example, one area where we should be targeting this, uh, this type of cooperation. And of course, there's a lot of, you know, we can say a lot about ESG, et cetera, but I, I absolutely believe that if we were not sensitive to environmental and social issues in mining, we will have, uh, we will have a backlash on the energy transition because people will say it is actually not a, a clean transition and a just transition. I think this is critical. And finally, the, the, the last point I would like to make is more as an energy guy, um, and I'm, I'll be more raising questions actually than, than providing answers. There was a very interesting report from the IEA um, following you know, the, the increase in commodity prices in 21, 22, and the freight prices. Actually, when you look at th this trend, commodity prices plus uh, freight prices led to a 25% increase in capex for, for uh, renewable energy, offshore wind, onshore wind, even, even solar power, etc. Uh, one reason for that, for we talked about electric vehicles, if you take an offshore wind turbine, you have 15, mil, sorry, 15 ton per megawatt of critical materials in offshore wind turbine. You have one ton per megawatt for a gas turbine. If you consider that a typical offshore wind turbine today is 15, uh, is 15 megawatts, that's 225 tons of critical material. That is actually 40% of that is copper. If you have a doubling of the price of copper for uh, an offshore wind turbine, it's just 1 million, 1 million more cost for each offshore wind turbine. So, I think one thing we need to be aware of is that we have traded a short-term variable cost-based energy economy. Basically, electricity prices and energy prices were determined by the marginal cost of gas, oil, what have you, coal to a certain extent, to, a, to an economy that's going to be increasingly linked to fixed cost price. And that has dramatic changes to, the, to, to the, the energy market. Not saying it is bad or good, I'm just saying it will have implications. If you invest in a time where the cycle is very high on commodity, we will be locking for 25 or 30 years higher cost, and hence we will have impact on, we will have impact on competitiveness. And so I'm aware that I'm not bringing any solutions there. I'm just saying that we, we need important. to be very cautious of all these implications. I think one thing it means is, as an investor, I would say we need to find ways to soften the boom and bust cycles that will have repercussions on the capex. I think innovation is critical, and cobalt is a good example. Um, you know, we first had NMC, NMC batteries, which were 532, so 5% nickel, 3%, oh, I mean, 50% nickel, 30% uh, manganese, and 20% cobalt. Now we're, we're running rather on 900, so it's actually 90 nickel, 0 0.5 manganese, 0 0.5 cobalt. So indeed, innovation will help us build some resilience. At the same time, if we innovate and we deprive some of the countries that see that as a way to, 
to create sustainable wealth for them, this will also pose a problem. So that means that, again, this calls for heightened cooperation to, to avoid that some countries that may want to today invest massively in some of those, uh, in some of those minerals, if there is a massive innovation in 10 years, don't, see, don't find themselves with, with stranded assets and, and, and a link to unjust, uh, unjust uh, uh, transition. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, for fascinating views from different angles, for your time discipline, uh, which gives us now uh, the possibility to have uh, time for discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you and the panel whether someone wants to reply or contradict or especially support something what somebody else in the panel said. Uh, anyone? Please, uh, Christophe, <coughs> premier. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe I just want to be back on what you mentioned regarding the, what I call the responsible mining activities, which is uh, very important for the future. Uh, I want to s specifically stress that first, we need to invest in terms of research development to define what's going to be the responsible mining. I mean, how, could, how to design a mine with a very low environmental footprint, a very low water consumption, very low waste production, and so on. So you can decline on every type of indica environmental indicators. So we have already some clue, we have already some directions to move forward, but we still need to invest in this direction. Second, very important, the social aspect. And uh, for sure, all what we are doing right now, at least in France, regarding the development of new mines, either on our country or abroad, is within this concept. And within also the, the aim of relocating a significant part of the added value in the country, uh, help the country to develop this type of mining activity instead of, uh, uh, let's say, dirty mining. And uh, so I fully agree with what you mentioned. It's a real critical uh, uh, point to, to address and to success if we want to be able to, to develop this new mining activity. Jonathan. Yeah, I would, I would like to make one <coughs> thing very clear. The materials that we're talking about, they will not come from G7 countries. They will come from different countries. And the statement or assuming that this will be the case is also very dangerous because we lose time in taking action and putting attention where it's needed. The most prospective projects are, in, for example, in the case of copper cobalt in the copper belt, right? That's Zambia, Democratic Republic of Congo, up to, the, um, up to Angola, right? The next generation of, of new projects will probably in the orogenic belt. That's Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, right? Not on the radar for everyone. Um, now we're talking about Saudi Arabia, the Nubian Shield, the Arabic Shield, right? This is where we need to focus our attention. And it's very dangerous if we seem to believe that, that we can get away with putting policies in place and developing and subsidizing projects in the developed countries. We need to put our, intention, uh, our attention to these type of countries. And I totally agree we need to do this in a sustainable manner, but it needs we need to take the responsibility in solving the problems there and not here. Thank you, Philip. Well, uh, I perfectly agree with what uh, Nicolas said uh, about the uh, necessity to take care of environmental and social problems. But you have also, unfortunately, to take care of political problems. And remember one thing, uh, which is valid for fossil fuels, but also and historically far more uh, for metal mining. This is what I call the commodity curse. Uh, remember that a country uh, which bases its development only on mining is fairly often an unstable and corrupt one. Uh, let's put it frankly. Uh, if there is a country which should be at the top of African development, it should be the Democratic Republic of Congo. And because of, Cobra, be, be, because of copper, because of cobalt, because of Colton, because of diamonds, the DRC is what it is right now. So, unfortunately, uh, we have to live with that. And that explains why there are very few countries in the world which have uh, uh, 
really manage their commodity curse. Norway is a case. Chile, for a certain time, was one. Now they are thinking of nationalizing their, their resources, which is probably not a good solution. Botswana was for diamonds, but there are very few cases of country which have managed to uh, advert the commodity curse. So this is something which we have to take into account. And the fact that, anyway, the only good forecast that honestly, I'm, not, I'm never sure an economist can be honest, by the way, but if I were an honest economy, the only forecast I could make on all those metals is that tomorrow prices will be different than today. And the only thing I'm sure of is the volatility of prices. And on that volatility, you must manage to build long-term strategies. Good luck. I would like to turn to the to the audience. I have uh, uh, two voices here. Uh, first, the lady in the second row, then the lady in the first row, and then you. Please, Mar Marie. Uh, and if you would briefly introduce yourself, please. Okay, I'm uh, Marie Roger Biloa. I'm a uh, producer from Cameroon, media producer. So um, thank you for your very uh, uh, inspiring and fascinating pa panel. Um, after having listened to you, one of the major issues here is still environmental problems. And uh, you, you alluded to that, and I'm, I'm sure you are uh, aware of the controversy about the, the um, electric battery, and that is not that clean. You know, all the, the kind of problems it's posing to environment, uh, carbon foot, footprint, uh, you know, um, when you compare it to the traditional batteries, et cetera, et cetera. So um, how, do, how come that, um, I would say, the, the, the electric battery has been developed full speed despite of that? Everybody one is in that front. France has uh, allowed for billions of development and et cetera, et cetera. How come and how uh, do you intend to solve all those problems? So that is one of the first questions. The second one is um, how can you um, enforce the need to have um, a fair share in the value chain for the, the producing countries like um, DRC, African countries, whoever they are. Because uh, everybody knows that there's a huge problem. I, I like the reference to the Ogoni. Uh, but who can enforce that? Is that uh, should we rely on the goodwill of uh, the actors of the chain? Or uh, should we think of a governing body to enforce uh, a better uh, repartition? Thank you. Merci, Marie Roger. Uh, I, I, I th suggest that we collect a few uh, voices and then turn back to the panel. Lady in the first row, please. Thank you very much. I um, appreciated uh, the word of Mr. Corbero. Um, these cell phones and all this very high tech industry is happening because the minerals are the mines and minerals are coming from southern countries, Africa uh, in particular. And when I hear you, I mean, you're doing the right, you're saying the right thing. But why it is not happening in the field? Why it's a completely different story. Um, environment, she said about it, but the worth is, um, and there is a responsibility from the African states um, who are overwhelmed by so many problems, and sometimes it's difficult for them to, to enforce their own legislation. But it doesn't even make sense for me from an economical point of view. Um, you are operate, my, mining companies you rely on are operating in low, less environment, um, child work, um, of course, um, you know, polluting the lakes, um, and no investment whatsoever within the community 
um, they are surrounded by. So it doesn't make much logic for me because the next step is they're going to be uh, sort of kicked out of many places with the new generation of leaders coming in in Africa because this is not going to last. So I think you guys who are at the end of the spectrum should talk to those companies that are your providers uh, because you might be running out very quick. Uh, because this is not going to end. And this is the, the major, major outcry of the young uh, generation of African. Um, being looted, because that's the word, um, and nothing is being done. But when we are in four hours, the right things are said, but never done. So what are your takes on that? Um, because what you see is what you, it's going to happen in Niger. Unfortunately, um, a company invested um, there, and now it's going to be a lot of problems because uh, the new <laughs> military regime is, is, is focusing on, uh, on them, but they should have you know, prevented that. If you, if, had they done the right things, I don't think it would have happened. But this is going to be a general trend in Africa. So your industries might quickly be at risk because you will not be having at the same cost, in the same condition, the product you need to develop your industries. So what's your take on that? Because the talk is there, that's what Marie Roger was saying, but it doesn't change over six decades, but it's gonna stop because now it's really, really the hot topic and if somebody like me is in power, I can tell you that's gonna be one of my, one of my priority because it, it cannot last. It's impossible. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank uh, both of you for, for your comments. And, and when I said we, we carefully uh, balanced the panel, we, we did, uh, well, at least one mistake. We should have had someone from the global south here on the panel on these issues. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm particularly grateful the microphone goes to this gentleman there. I'm particularly grateful that you raised your voice and that you did so uh, quite uh, forcefully. Uh, I take uh, two more voices and then turn to the panel for a final word. It's the gentleman here and the gentleman in the fourth, uh, fourth row over there. Okay, I'm Daniel Landler from Paris. And I have a question which is a, a real question, an honest question, not an in implicit reproach. Uh, Whenever everyone on the panel seemed to take for granted that demand was inelastic, so that by 2030, 2080, there would be the need of so many billions of tons of this and that. As if it were a law of nature, it's not a law of nature, it's at most a law of statistics with a little bit of uh, implicit sociology. We, how are you going to take into account the fact that maybe by 2030 or 2050, people will decide not to have an EV and have a bicycle instead? And again, I'm not being ethical or anything normative. I just want to know how come you don't seem to want to take into account the fact Certainly. that the demand is not Understood. rigid? Thank you so much, sir. Please, here, uh, Arash. Thank you very much. Arash Duro here from uh, Dubai. Um, I think it was very clear from the discussions how critical these materials are for um, strategic industries like uh, energy, uh, renewables, etc., AI, robotics, you name it. Um, what I was kind of missing is um, the financial aspect of it all. The, so uh, you mentioned Dr. Copper, one of the most critical materials and so on. But uh, when you look at geopolitics, to me the most significant, most critical metal that's not even on the EU list of critical materials um, was gold. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine in March, the ruble... Um, dropped almost to historic lows. Uh, immediately following that, Putin came out and said he's going to pay 5,000 rubles per ounce of gold. Now, from March 2022 to June 2023, the ruble appreciated 158%. So there was an effective temporary gold standard for three months where he stabilized the currency and essentially negated the sanctions for a while. Um, 
Now, that sent a message to China, especially after the freezing of the Russian funds, where China has gotten a message that they cannot rely on the US dollar as a reserve currency going forward if they have intentions of doing whatever they want to do. Um, the BRICS recently came out and said they want to come out with their currency, perhaps backed by gold. Um, there's been record buying by central banks, especially in Russia and China, of gold. Now, I haven't heard gold mentioned anywhere. I don't hear it mentioned anywhere in the EU. Uh, it's always about, uh, you know, renewables, etc. But if you don't have the financial bedrock to finance all of these industries, I mean, let's be honest, the, the energy industry in Europe is highly subsidized and it relies on the primacy of Question, Western please. financial institutions, um, almost finished, to, to actually finance these industries. So what about gold? Where do you see that? Great questions, great uh, statements. Uh, you have now the difficult task to answer in everyone has 30 seconds. So just take one question which you think is there were many statements also you. Yeah. So go ahead. We start with Jonathan. Yeah, let me let me maybe tackle a few uh, topics that the ladies in the, in the in the front mentioned and I think it's a it's a very important topic that requires a lot more discussion and a lot more engagement. Um, and it's a very complex topic so I'll just pick a few of the things that you mentioned. So first of all with regards to dirty mines and the pollution there is no ambiguity on understanding what a clean mine is and what a dirty mine is. There's very rigid global standards that needs to be followed, and there's a whole ton of experts that go into the nitty-gritty of doing this. Now, whether this is done and followed, that's a different topic. And, and here I totally agree, it must be enforced, and it must be leveled, and we need to have more uh, balancing and more audits. Right? But you need to differentiate between industrial scale mines, semi-industrial artisanal, artisanal mines. And the second uh, topic of yours was um, with regards to a more fair value distribution along the supply chain. This is what I mentioned as well in, in my uh, brief speech. I, I fully agree. The answer to that is not a simple one. Um, we see tendencies of politics to enforce more uh, resource nationalism increase taxes and tariffs, usually with quite the opposite effect. I think what we need to do is, and it's, it's both the individual companies as well as industry organizations, to invest heavily in the communities itself. It's about the creation of jobs. It's also the creation of alternative livelihoods. Um, just to mention a few things. Thank you. Philip. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, just uh, about uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Handel said, uh, how do we uh, uh, forecast demand? I do perfectly agree with you. Uh, uh, Eluard said that uh, you shouldn't look at the past with today's eyes. Uh, it's uh, wrong to look at the futures with today's technologies. It's clear that we don't know. And I'm a bit, uh, uh, I take what is on the market as far as uh, forecast for 2040, 2050 are concerned. I don't know if my, if my grandchildren will have cows. Maybe cars will disappear, you're right, will be all cycling or will try to walk and so on. Uh, and well, the only thing I'm pretty sure of uh, uh, there might be some batteries. Will there be lithium or nickel or cobalt or anything else? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that copper will be extremely important because I don't imagine a world without electricity. And for the moment, well, you're more scientific than I am. It seems to me that copper, uh, you can't uh, escape it. Uh, by the way, Last gold, gold, we can get rid of it. It's Keynes who said it was a <laughs> barbaric relic. Gold isn't... Uh, it's a nonsense. You know what Warren Buffett said. It was completely stupid to go so deep underground and to get gold and then to bury it in the uh, vaults of central banks. So gold is completely stupid. Uh, right now it's uh, verging $2,000 an ounce 
uh, because there are some troubles in the world, so it's a good indicator. But uh, it's a most stupid investment because gold, uh, when you invest in gold, you freeze your money. Money has to circulate. Money has to be invested. Money has to create wealth. Gold destroys wealth. So, Understood. by the way, well, uh, and the That's rest, uh, we'll have private talk <laughs> with my African friends about the share, uh, the, the fair share. Uh, thank you. Christophe. Yeah, thank you very much. So maybe I'm going to be back on the uh, environmental issues and social issues reg with uh, regards to the mining activity. So I fully agree with what you both mentioned, and it's, uh, thank you very much for your comment, uh, which was very fruitful. I want to say that first, uh, we aim to develop any new mine at the highest environmental standard as possible, and it's not only a claim. I mean, we are developing the regulations, and the regulation will apply not only for mines in Europe, but for any material entering in Europe. It's what we call, for instance, the battery, the battery passport, uh, in which will be described the, let's say, environmental footprint of the material which are used. And they will have to be at the highest standards, otherwise they will not be able to enter on the European market. So it's a, a way, it's not the only one, but it's one of the ways to, to uh, try to uh, develop the highest uh, possible standards. And regarding the fair share, which is also very important, any project that we are developing in a country, it's not only a mine, it's a mine with all the transformation industry around in order to relocate the highest part of the added value in the country. And the, for instance, the uh, agreement which has been signed in DRC some years ago is within this framework. So we will build some plant in DRC, not only mining. Merci. Nicolas. Um, maybe to, to Daniel's point, I uh, fully agree. I think that's what I was trying to say on strandedness. Of, of assets as we go forward, because both innovation and your right social behaviors. So uh, I agree, this is one of our concern as energy players. Um, uh, not much we can do now, but you're absolutely right that we should be very careful to not lock in too much position in this, fully agree. To the point of fairness, uh, I will use Jerry Myron's uh, comment in margin call. We'll have to pay, and I genuinely think so. I think yesterday when we talked about transfer uh, from you know, rich economies to developing economies, we need to pay the real price of this energy transition that we are fueling. And, and for that, I think it, needs, it means higher royalties, potentially, that stays local, locally. Uh, it means that we need to probably subsidize so that also local populations, it, it has an impact on, on electricity prices or anything. It needs to be subsidized by the, by the richer economies People will say, this is, un uh, this is not acceptable from the Western point of view, but this is absolutely acceptable because this is exactly what we need in terms of co international cooperation, in my view. Rather than just giving money, it's better that we invest that money, that money locally on, by remunerating the real price of what we are asking for, uh, as a material. Thank you. I think this was a great panel, uh, great speakers. One disadvantage, which you pointed out very clearly with your remarks here from the first and second row, uh, we are still too Eurocentric uh, in what we are uh, doing. Uh, we have less and less people, relatively less and less power in the world, but we believe that we are still uh, the core of the world, and that is wrong, and therefore it is, I think, one message that we take. Uh, well, if we do this again, I would definitely ask for an uh, African or an Asian voice here. Uh, perhaps not only one, but two. Uh, and that is what we learned. Thank you very much for, for your attendance and your interest. <laughs>